Hello again, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, How to Implement Design Thinking for Quality in Your Organization. Excited to have you all here today, and hopefully this is a great informative session for everybody. Uh, today's presentation, uh, we'll go through some design thinking highlights, and since we have some folks that maybe weren't a part of our prior conversations, uh, we wanted to spend the first few minutes just with a refresher from our talk from this fall and kind of a high level overview of design thinking. If you're anything like me, you like a refresher because sometimes you go to a webinar and you learn a lot of great things, but then you go back to your day job and sometimes leave the learning behind. So we'll try to refresh everyone with design thinking of what we talked about in our previous conversations. And then uh, go right into some of the practical applications of design thinking and some quick wins that uh, you can implement right away. And of course, we'd like to leave the last five to 10 minutes or so for a Q&A session I uh, certainly love to hear questions during the course of the presentation as well, so don't be shy about entering those into the chat room. And uh, really quick, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Anne Hungate, our co-host today. Anne is the president of Daring Systems. Anne, how are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And I'm Kirk Walden uh, with TAPQA. Uh, I always like to share a fun fact uh, of the host and everything as we're... Uh, as more people are joining us as well. And what's, uh, what's a fun fact that people may not know about you? Really, I, I caught some folks off guard last week. They asked me the same question. I said, I play the trumpet. And um, it just wasn't anything anyone expected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I, and, and you said you, you play or you used to play or you still play or? Well, I, I play on occasion just to, um, I used to play a lot. I play now since I had kids really just to um, annoy them. And, and embarrass them. But I hope to, my baby is in high school, so I hope once uh, she's gone, I can I, again resume my lessons and play more regularly. Oh, it sounds great, it sounds great. I guess, uh, fun fact for me, um, <clears throat> and maybe this is a good opportunity for, to try out the use or, or uh, raise your hand functionality, but does anyone, does, it, does anyone remember the movie Drop Dead Gorgeous? It came out 20 years ago this past summer. Uh, raise your hand if you remember that one. We have a few that are raising their hand. So this was, it was a movie that was filmed in Minnesota, uh, where, I, where we are, where Tap QA is, where I'm from. And I was an extra in that movie. So I guess I technically have a movie credit to my name. Um, I was a blurry furniture shopping customer. Uh, so I have that going for me at least. But yeah, my one, uh, one moment on the silver screen. Uh, so that's my fun fact. So really quick before we get started, just a couple of things that we're going to dive right into the material. Uh, TapQA, we're the host of today's podcast. We are one of the country's largest software testing consulting services firms. We are very passionate about helping our customers solve any quality assurance problems you may have. And as we get into 2020 and some of the things we'll be talking about today and some of the trends in our industry, we're excited to help organizations grow along with those trends and really maximize the value you bring to your organization. So very excited uh, about that work and would love to hear from you all. If there's anything we could help with, uh, certainly I'll have some contact info to pass out as we move along. And Anne, why don't you let us know a little more about Daring Systems? Well, Daring Systems is really um, focused on organizations that are acknowledging the progress of digital transformation. Right, so we do, we have uh, some proprietary framework we call your fact-based operations framework, but really it's about knowing your numbers. Where are we now? Is it where we wanna be? Uh, if not, how do we make changes? So uh, that's Daring Systems is operational efficiency to support digital transformation. Great, and, and excited about partnering with you. I know, uh, you know, TAPQA and Daring Systems have worked together here for a short time and excited about our future together as well. Yeah, it's great. Well, you know, and they, it's hand in hand because um, organizations that have better quality practices have better efficiency and they really they thrive. Digital transformation is, is what we've been waiting for. Right. <clears throat> Wanted to quick uh, give a couple more plugs here too. Uh, we are hosting another webinar coming up on Thursday, February 27th. This is something that TAPQA will be doing a lot more of this year is producing more webinars and hopefully uh, one or maybe even two a month. Uh, our next one is going to be from data dependence to testing transcendence as we explore best practices in real world examples in test data management, which obviously is always a key topic and a hot topic. 
uh, we're going to have a real specific focus on how to integrate with your test automation solution. That'll be on Thursday, the 27th, and our host will be Michael Ginnabin, who is TapQA's Delivery Manager of Emerging Technology and one of our test architects. Very entertaining and energetic speaker, so we're particularly excited about this webinar as well. And then if you don't know, we have a podcast. Uh, our Tap Talk QA podcast is something you can find on Apple, Spotify, pretty much any podcast platform that you listen to. If you have a specific platform and you can't find the Tap Talk podcast, let us know. Uh, but recently we recorded a number of episodes in our 2020 vision series, which really had a focus on the trends that we need to be aware of as we go into the 20, as we go into the 2020s. And uh, very excited about those as well. And we'll have some more podcasts coming up, particularly as we get closer to conference season, as we preview different conferences that are out there. Um, so with that said, let's find out a little bit more about all of you, because this is very helpful for us to get to know our audience. So first poll question, uh, hopefully you see that, uh, or you'll see it right now. Uh, what is your primary role within your organization? We'll give people about maybe 30 seconds or so to fill that out. And we're seeing a pretty even split between QA leadership and QA practitioners, uh, which is to be expected, certainly. Uh, a lot of folks that are here are really sh strictly focused in the QA space. Uh, for those that put other, um, we have one who is a software architect. So thanks, Dave, for that. So yeah, about a 50-50 split between those in testing and those in test leadership. And I'll share those results with everybody here as well. So you can see that. And then uh, what is your primary role? Uh, let me grab that here real quick. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry. Uh, have you participated in one of our previous sessions on design thinking? And this is particularly helpful for us, Anne, because that way we can kind of tailor some of the review parts of it as well. Uh, so far, it is a unanimous no. <laughs> so uh, I think that's a good thing that we have a lot of folks who are excited to learn about design thinking for the first time, perhaps. Well, it's a good thing that we've got a nice replay coming up because um, we'll be able, folks who haven't participated in one of our talks, we're going to go do a quick, take a few minutes and go back to what we've talked about before. So we got your back. Yeah, great. And then our next. Uh, question is, what is your current comfort level with design thinking? And we have uh, a few options for you here. Uh, and the options are expert, uh, someone who's well-versed, someone who's comfortable but still learning, someone who's not that comfortable, or those who are just brand new to design thinking and really don't know too much about it just yet. And as the answers are coming in, and it is uh, pretty heavily skewed to those who are brand new to design thinking. Uh, so that's great. And, and we do have a, a, a recording of our prior webinar that uh, if you'd like a copy of that, uh, we can certainly send it your way. We also did a presentation at Star West, the conference in Anaheim in October. Uh, Anne and Michael Fleece, one of our founders and, and partners here at TAPQA. And I have a recording of that as well. So anyone that is interested in grabbing one of those prior recordings, we can definitely do that. Um, but and again, uh, heavily skewed towards those who don't know too much at all about design thinking. So that's great. So we'll, uh, we'll definitely uh, be able to cover a lot of those things as, at the beginning of our presentation. Uh, question for you, you can enter this into the chat room. What are you hoping to take away from today's presentation? Uh, we'll take just a you know, few, you know, few specifics there. And we'll give you some time to uh, enter that in. And as we're doing that, uh, we'll, again, focus on design thinking highlights here at the beginning of the presentation, the key concepts of design thinking, and particularly why it's important for software development moving forward, and especially for QA professionals in the 2020s. Uh, so for those who have entered in uh, some of the things that they're looking for, uh, a definition of design thinking and why for software development. So uh, that'll be the very first thing we get into is really the definition of the five steps of design thinking. And again, why it's important for software development and particularly important for QA. We'll take a couple more uh, suggestions that are, can 
as you're typing those in. Otherwise, we could just also just dive right in. We can do that too. So, and feel free again, uh, you know, if you have other things that you'd like to have us focus on uh, to answer that in, that'd be great. Otherwise, we will give the presentation as is, and I think it's still going to uh, fill a lot of needs here. <laughs> so, um, the reason we're such big fans of design thinking is highlighted by what the World Quality Report has found the last two years. And many of you are probably familiar with the World Quality Report. Uh, and of course, as all of you know, the role of the QA professional has gained so much importance in the past decade. Uh, it's always been important, but over the last decade with the advents in mobile technology and just the sheer volume of applications and ways that technology runs our day-to-day -day lives, QA has become all the more important. And as applications and technology gets more competitive with other products, QA is a real competitive advantage. The better your QA, the better your quality processes, the better, your advan the better your advantages you have over the competition. So, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pile on a little bit here, you guys, because our brands are digital before their um, storefronts anymore. If you even think about a product or you think about a place you want to go visit, um, the first place you, you experience them is digitally. They're, how many stars they have, what other people have had to say about it. Um, and so when we focus on quality and your quality experience, we're really focusing on the quality of your digital experience. And that's central to your brand. No, absolutely. And one of the terms that we'll mention a few times in this presentation is shifting left and how quality is sprinkled in throughout the development process where a lot of us probably came up through QA in a very traditional way where QA was shifted all the way to the right and everything happened after the fact. Everything was more quality control. It was before we produced software. It was before we released software. And now we are no longer just the people who find bugs. We're a much more important part of the entire software development life cycle. And we have to make a greater impact throughout in order to show value. And that is something that the World Quality Report has shown us over the last two years. It always used to be the number one priority was detect software defects before go live. And now it is ensure end user satisfaction. And that is certainly something that's not gonna change as we evolve into the 2020s. And that's where design thinking really comes in. And uh, we had another uh, uh, attendee who said what he's looking for is how a software architect can, in, can use design thinking and integrate more with the QA professional as well. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about that as well as we, you know, throughout the whole life cycle, how QA can use design thinking to add effectiveness. So while the QA profession, I mean, it's, it's become very technical over the past decade, as many of you know, and a lot of folks have felt, uh, you know, oh, I need to become a test automation professional or whatever the case may be. But great QA professionals are always going to be advocates for the customer. They're going to put the brand promise above everything else. And where QA professionals then can add that value is to be that advocate for the customer throughout the cycle. And software applications have evolved so much that there's so much functionality we can now Put into our software products. But as you know, the old saying, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. That certainly applies to software development as well. And that's where design thinking comes into play. We'll take a look at uh, specifically kind of our definitions of design thinking. It's solving the right problems the right way. And design thinking, and it's also called user-centered design. If you've heard of that term, they're not interchangeable, but they're pretty much the same thing. I mean, would you agree with that, Anne? I mean, I know design well, thinking- Design thinking is the primary technique under user-centered design. And the whole notion of user-centered design, and especially why it's relevant for architects, is that we are able to, before we design something, get quick feedback. Does it resonate with our customers at all? Exactly. Exactly. And, and the reason outside in is such a critical perspective is because we can become so focused on how we do things, the technique, how efficient our methods are, how elegant our methods are, what kind of functionality we're putting into the product. Uh, how many times have you worked with a developer that said, hey, I'm, I'm going to put some really cool things into this product. But again, just because you can do it, it doesn't mean you should do it. And a lot of times we, we focus on the what and we focus on so many things other than the two most important things, which are really the why we're doing something and the who is affected. And those are both things that we can do a much better job of identifying with design thinking. We're focusing our energy on what matters most and what matters most right now. 
So a simple definition is design thinking improves the ability to create innovative products for customers and prospects by framing product deliverables around direct user value and integrating with technical possibilities and requirements for business success. And we'd like to sum that up by just saying customer empathy equals business value. The more that we can live in the shoes of our customer and what they're really looking for, the better product we're gonna be able to develop for them. So design thinking, as we mentioned, it's a five-step process. This was made famous by David Kelly and the Stanford School of Design. And it's been around now for a little while, but really has become an important part of software development here just over the last several years as companies and organizations are adopting this to, again, ensure end user satisfaction. At the end of the day, that is a top priority for us. So the five steps are empathize, define, ideate, iterate, and test. And we'll walk through each of those uh, briefly as we go along. The methodology is just thinking like a user. So it's not a real complex methodology. It's just putting yourself in the shoes of a, of a user. And the ultimate goal, again, user satisfaction. An important component of this is that all stakeholders are involved. And we'll talk about that as we get through each of these steps. So the empathize phase. You're starting with your end user in mind before you even think about functionality. So you're, talk, you're asking yourselves, who are your users? What are they trying to do? And what pain points might they find using the product? An important component of this is creating a persona. Now, raise your hand if you have created personas in the past when it comes to testing. Are you doing persona-based testing or exploratory testing? I see quite a few hands that are, that are up and I appreciate that. Um, this is really, I, I feel, and, and, and we at TAPQA feel is going to be an important part of how we do testing as we move forward. It's really not just the green check marks. It is, we're making sure functionality works, but we're also making sure that we're testing in the sense of a persona, that we're creating what our end users are, how they're going to use it, and we're doing more testing in that way than we are with kind of the traditional test methods. Uh, but when it comes to design thinking, the persona is something you create right up front. It's the very first thing you do before you even start thinking about functionality. So, Anne, I know this is a persona that you put together, and it's a, it's a good example or a good template that can be used. And for those that are interested, we certainly are happy to share this, uh, where you're creating now the power user for a particular product. And Psy is the power user, and you go through what Psy's personality is, what his responsibilities and role is, his motivations, potential frustrations, and then the goals that he has in using this product. So as we identify who the persona is, and of course products can have multiple, and in some cases, many personas, as you identify all of those, it's gonna help to put the design, of, or to be able to create the product for Psy specifically, as opposed to just saying, hey, this is what I think the world is gonna want, or this is the functionality I wanna put in the product. You're putting the functionality that Psy wants to use, or whoever the persona may be. Next phase is the define phase. So you take the discoveries from the empathize phase and you're really starting to focus on how the needs will be addressed. And I think this is where QA makes a particularly big impact because you're able to provide your expertise and insights on potential areas where you could see defects or where problems may arise in the overall testing cycle. So this is one of those ways that are allowing us to shift left. Of course, we've all heard the term shift left and that's involved QA much earlier in the process than traditionally where we've been on the back end. And the define phase is really an important component for QA and where they can make such a big impact. So after getting through the define phase, you go to ideate. And this is really, think of the big brainstorm session. So a giant whiteboard and where everybody every stakeholder has a chance to throw multiple solutions on that board. And as you're creating those solutions and as you are weighing in multiple options, this is where you create your customer council. And Anne will talk a little bit further about the customer council and the stakeholder council later on. But you're creating that council and everybody gets a chance to weigh in with their own solution. And no idea is a bad idea. It's a classic brainstorm session. Let's throw everything on the board. Let's get every idea we have and then we'll start to narrow down what solutions we should go after. And of course, this is where personas come into play as well, because you're coming up with ideas, not just for you, but for the persona that you are putting yourself into. And then the iterate phase. 
And this again happens before products are released. And traditionally, or in many cases, we have made changes to products based on defects that we find as QA professionals and then negative feedback we get from the, the world when we send our applications out to the app store or to our customers. That feedback is really what drives the change in design. What the hope is here is that we can change that design before the world even sees this product. So that's again where QA professionals, they earn the badge of software experts versus being bug catchers and really help with the overall process and putting these products together. So this isn't rework. This allows us to make improvements based on everything we're finding out about the product throughout the process and, and potential pitfalls we may see, and then allows us to make that product the way it should be made right up front. And then the final step is test. And of course, we're all testers. But this isn't testing in the sense of running through a test script. It's validating the assumptions that we've made in the first four steps. So simulating how the users will most likely be interfacing the product. Again, it's putting ourselves in the shoes of Psy and whoever the, <laughs> the persona would be. And it's creating the interactions between the product, its user, and the environment. Is the person going to be using it on a train? Are they using it at home? How are they using the product? And then you validate all these assumptions before you even start writing code. So all of this happens before code is written. And talk about shifting left. That is shifting left in the truest sense. What you're doing with the test phase is figuring out what problems would arise from the interaction that you've created and then capturing all that feedback. And I'll, say, I'll ask again, raise your hand if you've ever heard a developer when you've come back with potential issues that a product would have, a developer says, why would anyone use it that way? I'm guessing I'm going to see about 100 hands. <laughs> and yes, that's about right. Um, that's not a valid question in the test phase, because if you testing for yourself or testing in the shoes of a persona, if you have used it in a particular way, chances are very good that someone else is going to use it in that way as well. So it's finding out why the user used the product that way, how it made them feel, et cetera. And then capturing that feedback and potentially making the changes to design based on that. So it's testing, but it's testing in a much different way. It's validating assumptions. And design thinking happens before IT delivery gets involved. And a lot of design thinking experts would insist that it can only be done at the start of a project. And as much as we talk about shift left, and as much as we know it's ideal as QA professionals, sometimes we need to work with what we have and that's not perfect. But the cool thing about design thinking is you can follow these practices at any phase of the project life cycle and at any level of maturity. So there's a lot of opportunity for us as QA professionals to make a bigger impact along the way. So does everyone see that? I mean, that this is, this is, stu this is stuff that we can really, really make an impact as QA professionals. And I'm going to turn it over to you to get into some of the specifics on design thinking and exactly how we do it. Okay. And I'm promising for anybody who has the issue with um, words that IT folks make up that we are not going to use the word ID8 from now to the, to the end. Um, Cause that is, it's kind of a man-made word. They've got a little, uh, I guess all words are man-made. This is new. It's a new word that popped up as design thinking was really getting popular. Um, again, because I think you guys is outside in. And I, so before I got to quality, um, coming up the um, software engineering ranks, right? So first I was a, a developer and then an architect and then started engineering processes and then I came over to quality. So that's kind of, that's kind of my background and in college. I studied, um, I was an analytics major, right? So I've been, this whole notion of shift left was something I was studying a long, long time ago. Um, and, 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 and so so long ago that I can tell you that, that the concept was actually captured by um, GE engineers back in the 70s. And um, they called it phase containment. And you can look up an engineer named Barry Bame. Um, B-O-E-H-M-E, -E, I believe, is the person who came up with this concept. So. Um, there's four key components of design thinking as a technique, and I, I want to use these components to show you how you can use design thinking methods um, and thought processes in, in activities that are established QA scope, right? These are things that 
other domains aren't going to fight you on. But if you get really good, other domains are going to ask you for. So the four key things are opportunity statements, the customer council, teamwork, and validation milestones. Kirk, let's go into an opportunity statement. I'm sure you guys have seen these by now. They've, uh, they've been, again, popular for probably five or six years. As a, you know, development manager, I want to see the workload in the system so that I can balance assignments across my staff. Right? You can plug a lot of things in here. But with these opportunity statements, you guys, even if your um, QA work is still relegated to the right side of the metric, the right side of the life cycle, you can still use opportunity statements to look at how and why, why you're doing something. Who cares about it? Why does it matter to them? Okay, let's hit the next one. Um, and, and the cool thing about customer counsel and design thinking becoming popular is that um, not customer is uh, teamwork is that oh you guys I said we weren't going to use ID8 again and curses yeah, yeah, that's my fault I, I should have pulled uh, that off sorry about that <laughs> but no but we have to stay true because we are using um, concepts really that we're using right as you mentioned is it uh, John Kelly out of Stanford so he is, so we're staying true to that but the cool thing about what he said is said you know what nobody works in a vacuum. Right, when we get this design done, when we're really doing this, it is, we've got to get multiple domains working together. So um, QA and engineering is at the table with product people, is at the table with the design people. And we're really starting to work together on, can this work, should this work, why would it work? And then the next piece, I love the next piece, is getting this validation real time. First time I did a design thinking project where we were intentionally and physically invested in design thinking methods, I was um, working with a, an insurance carrier, a healthcare insurance carrier that had um, six new features they wanted to roll out to their mobile clients and the product manager had them prioritized. And as part of the design thinking method, um, we said, great, we love that priority. We're gonna um, create some opportunity statements and run this through a customer council. And we are gonna validate that those items are prioritized the way customers wanted them. Now the highest priority one had about 30% of the budget, right? Because it was quite complex, but the product manager was sure that's what customers wanted. Fast forward five weeks later when we had finished with all of the customer councils, and guess what feature the customers didn't want? The number one that the product manager had said. Mm -hmm. Guys, we had the data right there. We took it off the table, done. Now we had moved, we had reduced the project budget by 30%. We had brought the timeline in by 50%. We just didn't do, we didn't make something that people didn't want. So these go, no go, points in time are, you know, as quality professionals, we're really, we're really familiar with them. The power of design thinking is it's, it's credibility and voice is handed to us right now. So some of the common sense that we've had all along, we've got a voice for. All right, let's keep going, Kurt. Is, let me stop. You guys, who's got questions? Let's, let's go ahead and throw them up in the chat window or in the Q&A, either one. All right, we got no open questions, so let's keep going. I want to respect everybody's lunch time, and um, I'm also going to admit that while Kirk was talking, I was eating my salad. <laughs> no problem. And, and anyone that has questions, we will answer those during the course too. So if you're still in the middle of typing, feel free to finish that up, and we can uh, interject moving okay. forward. So, and uh, some practical actions. Uh, All right. Let's jump into those. What I like about these practical actions, you guys, is we want to give you some low-hanging fruit, right? These are things you can take back to your job today. You don't have to force your way into design sessions. You don't have to ask for permission. You don't have to go buy a new tool. These are some things that you can do within the scope of your current role, within the scope of your current project. And, and you got the data. Make it happen. So let's hit the first one, which is an oldie but a good 
activity and one of my favorites, but before it was one of my favorites, it was one of my unfavorites. When I moved from engineering, just because you know I, I didn't grow up the ranks of quality. When I got my first um, quality team, I'm like, what? Why do we have, why are we wasting a person on being a defect manager? You know, fast forward, this is me, you know, a dozen years later when I run, um, you know, a, a global team. I, I'll tell you what, accurate data is everything. And defect management data is really powerful design thinking data. So Kirk and I threw together a few opportunity statements. So as a product owner, I need to know the health of my product so that I can direct investments to where they matter most. And as a VP of development, I need to know where we have defects so we can address process and product problems. Okay, what's really cool is we can apply design thinking to our stakeholders and our customers who are internal, right? Internal customers are still customers and it's a chance to practice this method. All right, so um, why does defect, what are some of the insights I can get from defect management? I can answer some tough questions that are on the next slide. Like, what's my backlog by severity? How much, you know, you could have, with defects are, are a type of technical death, de debt, right? So we're knowingly moving problems into production and you could end up with death by a thousand cuts, right? It is a very visible, quantifiable, amount of technical debt, right? And then we can look at the density, where, which, which modules or which, or which components of the system have the most debt. When did defect arrival pattern is when did they show up in the life cycle? Do we have problems with our phases? Defect management can actually create the opportunity to fund a design thinking workshop for your team. Mm -hmm. Right? When you show, hey, 80% of our problems are coming from the story phase, right? So what do you need to get it done? The first thing you do, you have to have a system of record. Without a system of record, you don't, and it can't be Excel. I love Excel, I love Excel as much as the next guy, but we need something that we can, um, we can do many to many relationships. We can query, sort, filter, prioritize, and it's, but it's gotta be more robust than Excel. And you need some basic criteria. Don't over-engineer this, guys. Don't over-engineer this. But basically, what's the priority that it gets fixed? Um, how big is it? Small, medium, large? It doesn't have to be more than that. Um, when did you find it? And who's responsible for it? When we do, you know, when we do this, we can start answering the most important questions. A few more things you have to have. You have to have a workflow. And the reason you have to have a workflow, and, and we are tripping up on this one right now, is because when you move from a project to a product, that, 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 that defect, that debt needs to keep living. So your workflow has to say whether it's getting reassigned or who takes ownership for it. But you know, once the project ends and the project team disbands, the problems didn't go away. So you gotta have the workflow for that. And you gotta find somebody on your team who is a data junkie. If you don't have a data junkie to keep track of this and keep the data clean, get an intern, right? It's intern season. First time I did this, I got a, a math grad student who not only cleaned up the defects, just started building some charts and developing insights. And it was the start of a really thorough analytics program um, that, that really let us change our process. And for those of us who live later in the life cycle, we need to be less emotional and we have to be more fact-based. And this is your source of truth for your facts. Mm -hmm. So let's hit the next one. Just a couple, couple more things you have to do. So I want you to try it out on a project. Don't make everybody do it until you tried it out and figured it, figured it out. But when you have it pretty close, and it doesn't have to be perfect, just pretty close, roll it out across the board, right? Um, and you can't just stick out a bunch of data and say, well, I put it in there and I expected somebody to read it. You've got to set up the conversations, the flow, the platform, whatever you want to call it, um, so that you're having conversations about these things, whether once a week you're looking at them or uh, there's a, you know, 
uh, every other week, five minutes stand up to go over the bat. You come up with what works in your culture and with your language. Um, but, but keep reviewing them on a regular basis and look for trends. All right, let's hit the next one. Well, let me, should I pause for a second, see if we get some questions. I see one red box. Um, okay, if you guys, if you have any questions, mm -hmm. don't hesitate to stop me. And this one is uh, not specific to defect management, but uh, a, I think a good question nonetheless is how can the shift left mentality be applied to agile? Uh, great question. I love that question. So shift left is really, it's the Barry Bain mathematical model that, and I, I wish I, I should have put this graph in here. I'll put it in the next one, you guys. Think of it like um, a bell curve. Every project ever, even every Agile project really is a bell curve where we have um, resources, so money, machine time, people on the left axis, and time on the right. And if you follow that bell curve, shift left is you want to find and fix your problem before you peek out the bell curve and you've maxed out your expenditure of resources. How does it work in Agile? Um, if you are somebody whose job or life cycle traditionally is that you don't get involved till after you've peaked out or till you're peaking out on resources, you actually have to um, bring yourself into the conversation earlier. And I, I, the first time I had an Agile expert come and talk to my co-legged team was 2009. And he says to them, hey, you guys, how many of you have been um, called into work and forced to work over a weekend in the last month and every single hand went up. And he said, how many of you have been on the receiving end of late code from developers? Again, every hand goes up. He's like, and how many of you feel like you've never given enough time to get your work done? And every single hand goes up. He's like, yeah, I hear you. This is a lot of pain, but I've got one question for you. Who told you to wait? You could have heard a pin drop. How do you bring design thinking and shift left to agile? Don't wait. We get into these ruts and these roles, into these mindsets. This is where we're supposed to be and we wait. So um, it's really, really important. It's like kind of my soapbox on that question, Kurt. I guess you, you hit a trigger. You guys, you don't have to wait. Based on your, your role, it doesn't mean you enter at a certain time. You bring passion, knowledge, insight, experience, and perspective to every problem. Bring it to the table as soon as you can. So um, I'm going to take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> While you're doing that, Anne, um, one question that we also got, and uh, unrelated to the topic at hand, but just more on the presentation, uh, for those who have joined us a little bit later, we are sending a recording out. Um, I, if you've registered for the webinar, I have your contact info. If you are joining us based on a link that maybe someone emailed to you, or you're going along with someone who is registered and you want to have this presentation, uh, or you just want to double check and make sure, please feel free to type in your name and email address in the chat box. Uh, and I'll make sure that you're added to the list of everyone who gets this. We're also going to be posting our presentations moving forward on the TAPQA YouTube channel. Uh, so right now we have more, I guess you could say marketing type things out there. Uh, it is where we're going to be posting tutorials and how to's and webinars. So uh, we'll be posting it out there as well. But yes, I will be sending a link to uh, download the presentation, hopefully later today, if not tomorrow. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the next two pretty quickly, so we leave some time for Q&A. Because the next thing you can do to bring design thinking to your quality to team is start testing your stories. And use the static method, that means test them without executing code, right? We, we're going to do this to eliminate ambiguity, clear assumptions, and get rid of any misconceptions. So how do you know if a story is good or not? Let's hear the next, you want to go to the next, uh, the next slide? So here's how we know if a story or a requirement is good because it's unique, precise, bounded, testable, and relevant. 
this is really important. Um, I want you testing stories and giving feedback on stories because when you do this, the developers are going to get better stories to work with. So you're going to get better material to work with. Um, a lot of you who, who are in agile environments do test driven development, behavior driven development. These are things we're looking for. They really matter. And in the spirit of opportunity statements, they matter to developers who want to build high quality code and don't want to spend their lives doing rework. Testers who want to get engaged early, right? So you, you're not backed up against the wall and working a weekend when your kid's got a basketball game and you can't go. Um, I think we have a couple more opportunity statements. Kirk, you want to hit the next Sorry slide? All right. So uh, product owners, they want to know when the products are going to be ready for market, right? So they go out with better results and customers want you to do story testing because um, they want to know, they want to be asking about their needs. They don't want to be handed a product that doesn't serve them. All right, so here's, so I did this before. I, and, and, and this was 2008, so um, please forgive, we were early in the Agile days. So my metrics were all still following the waterfall model, but we started to test requirements and test stories on a project that we had tried and failed a couple times before. So I started with the baseline. The first time we did the project, you can see, so I call a save is any defect I find when it's injected and an, an escape is anything I miss that, that happened at that phase and then just kept rolling. So you can see that we basically found the bulk of our problems when we got to system test. Um, and that even at UAT, even when we got to UAT, we still let um, more than half, we, we, what, no, less than half, 44, 44 out of, uh, so 46% of our defects escaped. Um, this is waste, you guys. When, you're, when you let problems, not only is it waste, what this doesn't show is that the product bombed. Not only had we moved a bunch of rework and a lot of problems into production, our customers didn't like it. So when we did the restart, we actually started by testing our stories. We tested to see they, if they were bounded, testable, complete, unique. Um, and let's hit the next slide, Kirk. And, and look at the top, top left hand where it says saves the number 829. I'm, I'm terribly embarrassed by this, but I, you need to know the truth. We found 829 problems with our stories. That means every story had multiple problems. Mm -hmm. And that's staggering because you had zero uh, on the previous slide. Zero. Right now, if your eyes go down a little bit, you see that when we got to system test performance test in UAT, we didn't find anything, nothing. Not only does this have a mathematical value, right? We save, we save somewhere between a quarter of a million and a half million dollars doing this. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, you guys, we went into production three weeks early with 82% adoption in the first month by our customers. That's, oh, that's, that's it's unheard incredible. of. Right? It's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, just the time and the money that you saved, I mean, that's adding real value uh, across the board, both financial value and just value. <laughs> so. We'll change the way we work together as a team. And, and right, you want to agile, you want to know how to get engaged, just start testing the stories. The developers don't want to start working on stuff that's not going to work. It's wasting their time as much as it's wasting yours. Don't wait. Go test the stories. So here's the last one. This is a kick in the pants that I got because um, I'm thinking I've just coming off that project and I'm crushing it and I end up with a new and I'm like, I love quality. We can engineer this. And I get a new CTO and he says to me, where's your burn down chart? I'm like, Oh no, the scrum masters, agile leads, they've got the burn down chart. I'm the test team. He's like, where's your burn down chart? I, I want to know what work you guys are doing, how long it's going to take, what resources do you have? Are you running ahead or behind schedule? I'm like, 
uh, oh, you got me. <laughs> so a burn down chart. So let me introduce this as a design thinking concept that is relevant and applicable to quality today. Because let's hit the next slide, Kirk. Because you have stakeholders. So as a project manager, I want to know, um, I want to report when we'll be ready so that everybody stops hounding me. And as a VP of development, I want to know when there are problems so I can bring the team the resources they need. Um, so before I go to the next one, when I put this um, burn down chart in place, you guys, what happened is the math didn't work out. The first time I mapped it out there, I realized that we weren't given the number of tests that we have, the priority, the effort it was going to take, and the number of people I had, we were going to miss our delivery date by three and a half weeks. Boom, it was right there on paper before we even started our like crunch mode where we started merging and integrating different work streams together. Um, so what did we do about it? Well, the first thing we were able to do is get rid of some scope. Were we trying to do too much? Yeah, and we brought it in about a week. The next thing I was able to do was borrow people from another team. There you go, gap closed. But it closed because I started with, um, you know, what do we have? What are we trying to do? With a perspective. That's design thinking. Outside in, not inside out. Um, so what do you need to do it? You need a pretty good inventory of the workload that's on your plate. And I say pretty good because it's going to move. You're going to discover things and stuff will get added, stuff will get deleted. So have a pretty good inventory and, and have a pretty good idea of how you capture that work. I want to know the, the basic effort it's going to take to get it done, the amount of time that generally takes, right? And, and who'd be the right person to do it and then do the math, right? You just straight line forecast that you add up. I've got 25 um, low effort things, 50 medium effort things, and 11 high effort things. Boom, you do the math. How many people do I have, right? And all of a sudden you can start seeing a straight line forecast. Can I do it? Can I not do it? Let's hit the next page. Um, really, I, I love this um, because the first time you do it, in fact, I just went through this exact same exercise last week with my team here, um, right? And found we had to start saying no to some stuff. And, but you know what? That's my job to go in and have a fact-based conversation with my executive leadership team. Right? But when I have facts and data to support it, turns out they're all super reasonable people. Um, the other thing I, I learned through this process is you gotta put the hard stuff first. Testers love to say I'm X percent complete. And I can tell you that doesn't mean anything. That is a, a vanity metric. Um, mm. for, yeah, so if you guys are a fan of uh, Lean Startup, vanity metrics are, are metrics that make you look good but don't really tell the story. The reason percent complete doesn't matter is because I don't know if you're testing the most important things, the hardest things, the most time consuming things. I don't know really if that's the work it's going to take. And the, the last thing is I really want you to start sharing this information with your leadership team. This is what they want to know about, right? They want to, they don't want to know about how are you doing something. They want to know about why and who right? Why and who? Maybe what, but not how. Um, right, and then so you start changing your conversation and not that, well, this team's late and this team's that. You'd start talking about risk and readiness. Risk and readiness, because that speaks to digital transformation. That speaks to your brand. All right, right I think I think I'm wrapping. Yeah. No, it's, that's great. And this has been very informative. Uh, question, I guess, rate, show of hands. How, how many folks are more excited about design thinking and the possibilities now than when we started today? Uh, a lot of hands. A couple dozen hands. All right, great. And that's, that's our hope. And, and really, uh, you know, hope that everyone learned a lot today. Uh, you know, maybe more importantly, you know, are, are, who's interested in taking the next step towards implementing design thinking? Or do you think this is a possibility that, uh, you know, with these quick wins and quick hits, 
uh, you know, is this something that you feel like you can bring back to your organization and, and start to implement some of these principles? Again, maybe show of hands. Uh, quite a few hands again. No, this is this is great. Uh, you know, and like you said, some real quick wins and some, you know, ways that organizations can start implementing this and, and really start adding value or start increasing value. We add all kinds of value, but increasing the value that quality assurance brings to an organization. Um, we're going to go into our Q&A. Uh, so if you have a question and we're going to take the next, you know, well, we have all kinds of time. I guess we, we don't have to end right at... Uh, one o'clock Eastern, but uh, if you have questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat room right now. Um, we can help kickstart your design thinking journey between Daring Systems and Tap QA. With our partnership, we provide both training and consulting services to ensure that your organization can add that maximum value and can incorporate design thinking and the power that it brings to the software development lifecycle and where QA can just add that much more value. And for all attendees, we are offering a free readiness assessment. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but just, you know, we'd love to talk to you about uh, where you are in your quality journey or where you are in your maybe journey with design thinking or where design thinking could be a part of that journey. We'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, you know, maybe make some recommendations based on training or consulting. We really just want to hear from you and be able to share more about how your organization could be even more effective. That's something that we, both of our organizations and we love to do that. That's, that's why we do what we do is to really help our customers and help everyone release better software faster. That's our, that's kind of our goal. That is our goal. So for those that are interested, um, you know, feel free to mention so in the chat room, you can reach out to us directly. Uh, Anne is at Anne at DaringSystems.com. I'm at K Walton at TapQA. And of course, we'll be following up with everybody with a uh, recording of this session as well. So our Q&A. So for those that have questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat room. Uh, I'll get started, Anne. And, and one question I know that has come up time and time again when we talk through design thinking and a lot of what we learned today that traditionally has, or a lot, of the, a lot of the things we talked about traditionally fall on the plate of the business analyst. Mm -hmm. And over the last several years, it's fallen more and more on the plate of the quality analyst and the quality assurance analyst. And yet other companies, the QA organization has been kind of shut out of being able to do a lot of these activities when we talk about uh, the design phase and requirements. And any recommendations or any, anything you can share on how we as quality assurance leaders can bring some of these principles and, and you know, not to take them away from the business analyst, but make sure that QA has a, has a voice at the table and can add this value through those five phases of the design thinking process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, your, the, this, uh, I, want, I want to answer slightly differently. I think that um, a lot of these activities have historically been uh, the responsibility of the business analyst. And when QA analysts start taking on some of this responsibility, QA analysts introduce opportunity um, to themselves, right? To open up their career, to meet new people, to take on new assignments. So um, it's, it's nothing but opportunity. And at the same respect, I love seeing business analysts start getting more engaged in um, the QA process, because think of those, is it testable, is it unique, is it bounded, right? Those criteria of what a, a good story looks like, when a BA needs to validate that, they, they then turn around and do a much better job getting that information the first time. So I think it creates a ton of opportunity for both groups, and, and it, it creates... Um, Right, not just a synergy, but it's something that really will resonate and hit the bottom line better. But I, I honestly, if we need the, the QA people have to inject themselves in and use the static requirements and story testing model as a way to, if you don't have a partnership with the BA yet, make one. Say, hey, I went to a webinar, they recommended this. How can we do this in your, your process? Is this something? I can come in and do for you, or this is how I'd like to come in and do it for you. One of the, um, one of the questions that came in, um, Kirk, to you and me, says <laughs> that for internal apps, it's, it's easy to talk to your customers, but what happens with external apps and public facing? Um, 
this is where your relationships with BAs and your user experience team is really important, you guys. So um, design thinking happens early in the life cycle, like all the way at the shift left, because it's technique. It's a, it's a key technique in user-centered design. So it's usually run by product teams with UX teams. And they have things like experience labs and customer councils, and they will come up with a profile of customers and bring them in um, and use focus groups. And I know focus groups is kind of an old saying, but um, just general different survey techniques to get the feedback from representative customer groups where how you guys, no matter what role you sit in, whether you're a BA, a QA, a, so a solution architect, a developer, you can ask for insight into the personas. Mm -hmm. You have your person, because the personas are what are used to form a customer council. So ask for, can I get access to the personas? Because I want to write my test scripts for the personas. I want to mm -hmm. write my story from the perspective, from the personas. Um, their personas are how you get external customer public facing application perspective. And the customer council is the implementation process. If your product owner and your UX team, they can't give you the personas, raise the red flag. Big raise. time, big yep. time. I mean, <laughs> As a QA professional, you're really helping them out too in creating those personas. I, I, what maybe has historically been, uh, you know, a product of UX or even a product of product product ownership, marketing, whatever you want, whatever the, the group was, uh, your company is doing a disservice if they aren't hearing the voice of the quality professional when putting together those personas. No, that's a great question. Um, we have a couple more that were in the Q and A section. Uh, we have uh, one question is can design thinking be utilized with Kanban and maybe how can it be designed or how can it be utilized with Kanban? Yeah, for sure. It can stick with um, one of the things I'd first do is design thinking of your Kanban board itself. Your, your rules around um, why do you put things on the board and who cares and who writes. So practice that way. Um, the next thing is with each one of these, I want you to be, um, I want you to do a review, a static review of every, every item you pull off the board immediately do a static review of it. Um, and the last thing I do is grab some metrics around when you haven't to compare when you haven't, haven't used, um, design thinking methods. Great. And then uh, one, one more question, and certainly we're open to more. If you have another question, feel free to enter it into the chat or the Q&A section. But what do you recommend how to, hand, or how to handle when the customer is unsure what the end result should be? Um, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. You run into that all the time. I, I, I assume that here's the thing. They're probably making assumptions. The custom, right? Your, your product and group is probably making, um, your business customers probably making assumptions um, about what the end result should be. So what I encourage everyone to do is track those assumptions, document them as assumptions, and then run, put in different validation criteria throughout the life cycle where you can say, is this doing what we expected it to do? If you're unsure about what the customers want, I, I, I really, really heartily encourage you to invest in a customer council. You, if you can get you know, a representative sample, 30, 40 people that hit your personas and you run your ideas by them, you get their honest feedback and then you're not guessing. When you roll something out, a new feature or function out digitally, you really expose your entire organization, you expose your whole brand, so test it, use customer councils. They'll keep you from having an egg on your face. 
Great. Well, that's uh, what we have for questions so far. Um, and again, I wanted to thank you for uh, joining us today once again. And uh, again, we will be sending out this recording to everybody. Uh, we'll stay here for just a few more minutes for any additional questions. Uh, for those that will be leaving, again, uh, anything that we can do to help with giving you thoughts on, and ideas on how to implement design thinking, that's certainly what we're here for. Uh, I'd love to have that conversation with you. Again, we'll be reaching out to each of you individually as well. Uh, again, thank you for attending our webinar. We are very happy to have you here and happy to help. I mean, certainly this is, again, why, why we do what we do. We, we love this stuff. We love to help. Uh, we'd love to help you out as well. So uh, again, we'll hang out just for a few more minutes. Uh, we'll turn off the recording here. But uh, again, thank you for attending and uh, save the date for Thursday, February 27th for our next TAP QA webinar, which will be a great topic as well around test data and how to uh, incorporate better test data management principles in with your automation solution. So again, Anne, thanks. Any last thoughts on, uh, on today's topic? No, no, I just really appreciate your time, everybody, and I look forward to continuing the conversation and uh, getting your feedback so we can make any of these webinars even more effective. Absolutely, yeah. Well, thanks, Anne, and uh, thank you all. And again, I'll be hanging out just for a few more minutes here as well if you have any other questions. So uh, thanks, Anne, and thank you, thank you all once again.